Scott, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Good. Sorry for all this. That's Sounds all right. Like... It's just, uh, you know, technology. What can we say? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so we're going through the computer, right? From what I understand, yeah. Yeah, okay. And John, is that recording? Or yeah, you're recording. Oh, okay, got it. There okay. All right, yep. perfect. Um, Scott, thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. And just so you know, we, we um, record these and then have like a studio kind of edit them. We can send you uh, whatever we have. And if you have things you want um, edited out or whatnot, uh, that's fine, depending on uh, your preview of it. Great. Yeah, no problem. That sounds great. Um, the, I think we kind of talked about this over email. You know, we started this as sort of a passion project, the whole podcast thing as a way to reach patients and uh, just engage with various folks from different backgrounds because the more we were having kind of water cooler conversations, the more we realized the amount of crossover, you know, kind of surgery, neurosurgery has with a lot of other disciplines. And, and then it was just an interest of mine to kind of get together with, you know, various people and have conversations. And so um, we were sitting around one day kind of talking about the way we evaluate quality in surgery is is a little bit strange. It's it's based around clinical outcomes, and these are largely based on um, patient surveys, basically. And the number of metrics we'll track from a clinical standpoint. But yeah. it, it part of the granularity that's lost is sort of the skill set of the the surgeon. And we've, the, the industry's come up with a number of different ways to try and, and get at this. And it's important in our industry because if you need a surgery, you want to know who a good surgeon is. Um, and we in the 90s, they kind of came up with almost like a quarterback rating type process. Um, it didn't really work because that ultimately the best surgeons would take on the most complicated cases and their ratings would be low and the maybe not as facile individuals would uh, kind of cherry pick easier cases and so they'd have you know Brett Favre's quarterback rating with with poor performance and in all of these attempts the idea of craftsmanship and being kind of a master craftsman um, it, it's just not language we use uh, for whatever reason we were talking about how that was sort of odd and then as, as someone who lives on Long Island, and, and I recently got into boating myself, I'm sort of a, a rookie, um, we started talking about how that, where is that concept, right? Where do you see the concept of craftsmanship? And, and we started talking about boats and manufacturing boats, and then, and then obviously Hinkley just kind of rises up in that conversation given mm -hmm. what the brand mm -hmm. is. So that was sort of the inception of the idea um, and and usually we just kind of have long form conversations and and edit out pieces that are interesting and kind of uh, sure. utilize that. So I was reading your background, and you, you truly are sort of a craftsman. I mean, you went through engineering school, you went through yacht design school. So your position now at Hinkley truly is sort of at the head of of speaking to and creating what craftsmanship would be to Hinckley. I mean, which is, uh, we kind of got the perfect person to talk to here, I think. Yeah. So maybe to get started, I don't know if you wouldn't mind just giving us some of your background, uh, how you, I know in through your bio, it had said, you know, you, you always had a love of water, but did you picture this, uh, you know, as a young boy, like designing boats or was this, did this sort of, organically grow out of a journey you took from schooling? No, it's a good question. Um, so, you know, really, if, if I were to reflect back on the origins of, um, if I were to fl reflect back on those origins of how it all started, I remember, you know, sailing, I, I, I sailed um, extensively as a kid. Uh, and cruised pretty extensively with my parents and my brother. And um, I remember at a very young age being very connected to the water and also the mechanics of the water, hmm. where I remember watching, um, I remember watching, you know, powerboats come in and out of slips. I remember watching how a sailboat moves through the water yeah. and not really, um, 
uh, I think fully digesting at the time what that really meant that that was something that I was really resonating with Um, and I think I look back on that now and that all makes complete sense Um, you know I didn't discover my that I wanted to do this as a career until I believe it or not got out of college and this was really a second almost a second career I thought I wanted to be a professional musician when I came out of college and um, when I was not uh, playing music and on tour, I would come back and I actually had kind of a part-time job that went into a full-time job as a boat builder um, with a, a guy that, with a boat builder that was on the, the uh, North Shore of Boston. Mm-hmm. Um, and from there, I really fell in love with the whole process and working with my hands. I started like a side business building half models for people. Uh, and then I went back to school for yacht design. Um, and so that was kind of where I, that was where I really discovered that this is a, you know, this is a passion, this is a, 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 um, a language that I had always been using in the back of my mind and it all kind of came to the surface. Um, and it, was, it, it became a very, um, you know, it, became, it just all made sense to me. Huh. Uh, and so when I got out of school, I, off I went into the marine industry. And, and how old were you? when you're you're kind of doing boat building in Boston and you're kind of discovering this path you're what like mid mid 20s basically yeah so i was let's see 98 so i was like 22 23 years old uh-huh. i was young i was fairly young and yeah. to go back a second to what you were saying about you know reflecting back to being a child in the water was that sort of the physics of the water and the boats moving kind of from a uh, from an en- from the engineering side I guess you might say or was that more uh, from the creative artist you know the beauty of that 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 ultimately you know plays some role in design right like is that yeah what would you well good question I, I think it was both yeah um, you know I was very I was you know interested in sailing because that's what I was doing I was I was actually had probably I had more of a fascination with power boats and how they mechanically worked and how they all how they move through the water and efficiency and all those types of things even as a young kid I, I wanted to understand how that all worked but really the emotion behind it um, I think the fascination with that and the beauty of boating which to me is yes about designing and building a beautiful boat but it's also about creating the best possible platform for people to create lasting memories on the water Mm -hmm. and i think when i started to have those lasting memories on the water it was all about being on the water it's about seeing and being on a boat that was beautiful that started to come to life later in my 20s later yeah okay and maybe you can comment on yacht design school like I'm imagining there's sort of the mechanics of boating and there's necessary engineering knowledge that goes into that, which is not, uh, I don't know, you know, engineering and, and beautiful could go together as concepts, but you, you tend to think of uh, one as sort of like a hard science and then there's sort of design and creativity and, and art on the other hand. This is my own mind here. Yeah. Um, did you, is it something where you had engineering you know your left brain engineering kind of person but then we're looking for a creative outlet or would you say not really you know that's a really good question um you know it's not dissimilar from you know the fascination that an architect has with a beautiful building Mm -hmm. Um, in order to make a building beautiful sure you have to draw a beautiful building and you have to understand how a human experience is it but you also then have to make sure you can design something that can be built yeah. um, and that can be strong. Uh, and as that applies to the marine industry and working about working in yacht design is that, um, you know, you can design something that is eccentric and, um, and, you know, incredibly beautiful that focuses all on form and less about function. And then all of a sudden you have a boat that doesn't, that doesn't function well in all sea states. Uh-huh. that maybe has a, a, a geometry that creates some type of a stress concentration that in the right, in the wrong sea state, the boat could break apart. So, 
a lot. It's it is really the marrying of form and function um, that is that's that's really accentuated in yacht design because in the leisure boat market we have this funny saying that life is too short to own an ugly boat. So <laughs> we're really pushing that envelope of what it what looks right, right, and versus what can what is going to perform what's going to survive the very nasty kind of unforgiving conditions of the ocean. Right. Yeah. We're really pushing that envelope. Um, is, so, so you, it, it, just for my own edification, it, Yacht Design School, how long is that? Like when you went and did that? So, good question. Um, so I, I had taken some engineering courses in, under, in my undergraduate in my undergraduate degree uh -huh. and then I went back to school it was literally it's a one year course that um, that's up in Maine that I took it was called a school called the landing school and it was huh. you know very intensive very project based um, and provides all of the um, required kind of engineering practice like strength of materials and you know, understanding complex areas and all that kind of stuff that you need in order to understand how a boat gets designed. Um, but you don't come out of that that school with a with a, a professional engineering degree by any sense of the imagination. It's more huh. design oriented and understanding the limits within the kind of that design paradigm. And so you come out of that and you go through a series of positions building boats essentially right yeah either building boats or or engineering boats so i came out of that um, program and I, my first job was working for a company called legacy yachts and i was uh, basically an engineer at a manufacturer um, and so i would be you know i would be designing certain aspects of a boat not in a boat in its entirety but we built a lot of semi custom boats there so we were we had to design okay this this gentleman wants a uh, you know, a special davit on the back of his boat to carry a, a dinghy, or this person wants a king size berth into the small space instead of a queen size berth. So we were designing, you know, small details of an existing boat. Mm -hmm. um, okay. and it wasn't until, and I did that for several years, but it wasn't until I got to my next role um, where I was, I worked for a company called uh, Pearson Marine Group, and we owned a bunch of different brands uh -huh. where we started to get more into the concept development and then the, you know, design for manufacturer and then, you know, to telling a marketing story and then promoting and selling a product right. from the ground up. And, and when you reflect back on that journey, uh, I imagine you're kind of building elements of the, of your craftsmanship, right? I mean, yeah. I, I, I in surgery, we'll frequently say, you know, I'm a, a better surgeon today than I was yesterday, and, and certainly two th years ago, it's sort of an ongoing learning process. Um, at what point, how long would you say it took doing this before you felt you were starting to develop sort of a mastery of that craft? That process. Well, you know, I, I I think mastery is a strong word. I think we're all on this journey towards it. Uh, yeah. I, it's it's a question of whether we ever reach it. Um, it's a it's, a, it's an ambiguous term. Yeah. Um, you know, I think for me, my my specific craft at this time, and I feel like it's changed over the years. You know, in the late '90s and early 2000s, it was really about. Um, you know, originally it was about boat building and carpentry and using my hands and that type of craftsmanship. And then it was, you know, create designing and coming up with the best possible solution for something that a client wanted or a design problem that we had to work through. Hmm. And now I've been at Hinkley for 10 years and it's about coming up with a product that, um, that allows that gets people really excited about being on the water and spend, you know, and creating really powerful memories. Uh, mm -hmm. with their loved ones um, mm -hmm. so that's kind of the craft now for me um, you know with that said I still am passionate about working with my hands so I'm always I, on the outside I'm always doing something along those lines but as it relates to Hinkley you know we have this really interesting task in both kind of the marketing and the design part of this business where we have uh, we have the most incredible, uh, the most skilled craftsmanship, some of the most skilled craftsmanship in the world that are building these boats up in Maine. Um, and they are, um, 
they've grown up working with their hands, they've been trained, they've been in and around other craftsmen that have been building Hinkley's for you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, so this is a craft that has been you know, honed over the years. It's a culture of, um, of you know, the best of doing things what we call the Hinkley way. Mm -hmm. And so from a design and marketing perspective, what we're trying to do is design a product, yes, for the end user, but that really plays into the, the strengths and the, the capability of our craftsmen, our craftsmen up in Maine. Mm -hmm. And so it's this, you know, it's this coming together of this, you know, this uh, incredible capability we have as a boat builder, this, the craftsmen that we have there, along with trying to figure out um, this intersection of form and function and, you know, creating the best possible platform for customers. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that does make sense. It's interesting because when I reflect on that from the surgery standpoint, in neurosurgery, unfortunately, we don't, it's not as much of a science as kind of the layperson might think, right? The, the mm -hmm. judgment element of it and mm -hmm. how certainly there's textbooks and, and neuroscience and, um, you know, all the various hard science fields that go into human medicine are uh typical cut and dry type fields and those books you know read like uh, a law student's books would read you know very dry and black mm -hmm. and white but then the actual practice of medicine um is is far more of an art than a science not in all the fields right i mean if you have something like diabetes you're treated with insulin there's it's almost algorithmic mm -hmm. but specifically in neurosurgery um, the art element of it, and obviously I don't mean painting with brushes art, but kind of making decisions that are best for an individual patient with, an, with a very individual problem. And, and a lot of our pathologies, they're very heterogeneous pathologies. It's not a homogenous group of patients. Mm -hmm. And so you're part of being that master craftsman as a neurosurgeon, I think, is the art of decision making welded with the skill to actually implement the vision. And mm -hmm. if I'm hearing you correctly, I see the I see a parallel there where mm -hmm. you guys have carpenters and uh, technicians who are executing, you know, could 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 make any variety of boats in, an, in a technically excellent way, yes. and, but that's not good enough, right? I mean, you, you have to design something, and this is probably, there's probably art on both ends of this, but um, that's sort of the, the judgment area, if you will, or the judgment overlap with neurosurgery where um, formulating the vision of that boat in your mind and how that will be uh, experienced by customers is what separates arguably one of the things that separates Hinkley. Yeah. The other thing that's interesting about Hinkley as a new boater, so for maybe like a little bit of background, I, I, I did grow up sailing with my father. He had like a, sh a, we did some sunfish sailing and then he had mm -hmm. a short, like 18 foot day boat mm -hmm. and good solid memories. I don't think it struck, I definitely struck and mesmerized by the water and boats, but clearly not to the extent you were. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and then now that I have kids of my own, it was something I wanted to pass on. So this spring I got a, a 22 foot bow rider and mm -hmm. took an online course on how to drive it around and started putting mm -hmm. around and, and noticing the boats in and around Long Island, yep. and, uh, the, the Long Island Sound and the North Shore. Mm -hmm. Um, and Hinkley boats, I mean, they stand out, right? They're, they're mm -hmm. distinctive. They're very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, and in, in a in a strange way, they sort of radiate the craftsmanship, right? It's it's a it yeah. catches the eye immediately, and that's the instant. I don't mean to blow smoke at you. That's almost the instantaneous impression, right? You can tell that from yeah. distance. Mm -hmm. And and I mean, I guess what you've already said sort of speaks to what craftsmanship means at Hinkley. But could you comment at all on what's that magic? Like, what? Why is it? you can look across the water and see one of those boats and it just pops and yeah. you're not confused by what you're seeing, right? It, it's right. definitely beautiful. 
Yeah, no, that's a great that's a great question. Um, you know, there's there is something in the way that the boat looks from far away, right? Mm-hmm. The, it's it's something that is um, it's of interest, and your you know your reaction to it, your kind of cranial reaction to the boat is like, oh my gosh, that's something I need to see closer. Right. And so yeah. when we think about design of a boat, we think about how does the boat look. You know, how does the boat look a quarter of a mile out? How is that going to look? How does the boat look, you know, maybe 500 feet out? And then how does the boat look at 100 feet out? How does the boat look at the dock? Yeah. And so there's there's elements that we think about for every one of those perspectives to make sure you still have that um, that emotional connection to the to the product to mm-hmm. the to the boat itself. So one of the things that um, that I'll comment. This probably more, that's more that I, that is more interesting to me that relates to what I just said. One of the things you'll notice on a Hinkley when you get up close to it is there is not there's very very few straight lines. Mm. Um, there is a lot of curvature uh, going through the hull where up in the front where there's a lot of flare, which is what you know where the um, the hull kind of transitions out to where the shear line is. Yeah, and then as it transitions aft. Towards, towards the stern of the boat, we have what's called tumble home, where the sides of the boat kind of curve upwards towards the shear after where the transom is. And all of that is trimmed. A lot of it is trimmed in wood. And the remarkable thing about wood, I don't know how much you know about woodworking, but mm-hmm. one of the things that wood doesn't do well is do curves. Hmm. The way that you get wood to do and to go in a curve is there's two ways. There's lamination and then there's a steam bending, and we don't do any steam bending. So all of the, the wood that you see on the boat that is curved, for the most part, if it's a drastic curve, is all laminated, which basically means you're taking layers and layers of pre-cut wood, getting it roughly into that shape on a mold, and then shaping that to the exact shape you want. Huh. It's incredibly labor intensive. It's basically like sculpture. Right. It's very hard to repeat over and over and over again, but it takes a lot. and that. Even though people don't really understand that that there's a huge process in doing it, they see the boat and they say, "I've never seen something like that," before. Mm-hmm. and that's remarkable. Um, yeah, what a, something that you, you kind of came up twice here in what, that process you just described. And then you were mentioning kind of the the folks up in Maine, what they've done to get to their skill level. So something that's resonating to me is what I've noticed from watching colleagues on the in neurosurgery. There are no shortcuts. You you cannot. There is no way to sort of uh, microwave a neurosurgeon into existence, right? It, it is a necessary. We, we take. Uh, you go to medical school. You go to seven years of training. You you spend time doing a fellowship, perhaps. That is not a process that can be sped up. It's like uh, cooking a dish. You know. The, yeah. You, that's where the microwave comment came from, and it's that sound i'm hearing that anyway in what you're talking about all of this there isn't a fast way to do that right like kind of printing a a fiberglass frame quickly and mass producing something is not there's not going to be a version of that for what the hinkley final product is basically right no that's true and and you know there are parts of the process that 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 are somewhat repeatable Mm-hmm. Um, that we can do, you know, through and through, but it's where that handwork that comes in and that carpentry and the, the detailing, which is, uh, which is not kind of repeatable by a machine. And that's the thing that people really see. Those are the details that people see that they get excited, they mm-hmm. get excited about. You yes. know, it's interesting because you mentioned, you mentioned that, um, you know, what this translates into is a lot of personality. Right. I was just going to, yeah. It comes into the final product. So I was going to ask you, just out of curiosity, because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm curious about how that manifests in your field. Like, what is your, um, you know, how does your personality come out as a neurosurgeon when you're doing your job? Yeah, yeah, you know, I, yeah. I was just gonna, you use the, um, you framed it that way. I was going to say, you know, the detail and the woodwork and all of this. When I, when I see that through the lens of a healthcare provider. That sort of says to me, and I think when you're looking at a product like a boat, you're like, there's a lot of care went into that boat, right? And that word transitions over because I think, yes, there's the sort of judgment. If you needed a 
neurosurgeon, you'd want someone with excellent judgment who's technically uh, proficient at what they do and all those things need to be there. But then they're also, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a journey you're on with the patient and that's a human connection and they need to feel, and you need, and there's no way to fake it, I don't think, you have to actually care for that person in, and that's something you, just like you would look across the water and, and see a boat like a Hinkley and it just strikes you and that's a thing, that's a, that's a concrete thing that you can try and define but it happens. I think the same thing's true in neurosurgery with, in, in all of healthcare, when someone cares about their patients, that's sort of universally recognized. There's something very human about that, and, it, and it's. I'm sure there are the occasional um, people who can who can dupe other people and thinking that's real. But I think most people are genetically programmed to pick up when that's genuine. Yeah. Um, and, and that's how I would say my what I try and pour into it is yes the the rigorous approach to become technically proficient constantly sort of honing that art element and trying to get better and better and better at that but to 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 get back to your question the personality comes out in the empathy and actually caring for people yeah. and how genuine that is because that, that's not um, if, if that's quote the final product on yeah. the healthcare side, you can't fake that, and totally. and I would say that you can't fake a, a Hinkley boat, right? I mean, there, you you can make a knockoff printed out of fiberglass, but there's going to be a difference, and and you're not going, no one's going to buy that, right? That's yeah, that's no, I that's a really that's a really great point. Um, thank you for sharing that. You know, I. There's an interesting comparison as well because, you know, a Hinkley is a thing. It's a product that's beautiful, sure, all of that. But the reason why people come to us is be, is because of the relationship. It's because of the care. Mm. We don't have dealers. You know, we don't, we're all direct. We have nine service locations all up and down the East Coast. People come because of the relationship they have with us. It's the care that they get when huh. they're boating and they know when something goes wrong we are there to care to, to be there for them oh, that's interesting. and yeah. you know it is it's very it's it, that is really the whole deal i mean that is the difference between us and many many other boat builders um, i mean there's a lot of companies out there that also build really nice boats but they don't have the foundation they don't have the the uh, the, the brick and mortar places through all of down the east coast to really support that relationship. Yeah. Um, yeah. We just, I, one of my favorite clients that I've recently had, we've got, I've got, we have so many great people that um, are our customers. They're just, it's an incredible group of people. Um, most recently, is this couple who bought one of our 48 foot uh, models. Mm. And it's a beautiful boat. It's got a lot of systems on it, there's a lot to it, but we try to make it really simple. It's very easy to maneuver for a boat of that size. But one of the reasons, you know, this is a very educated guy. He he had, you know, he had owned a lot of boats, and he he knew that the most important thing to him was yes, having a quality, beautiful boat that was comfortable. But he also knew that as he cruised for the next year, up and down the East Coast with his wife after just selling his business, he wanted to have the care. That's mm -hmm. what he cared about. Mm -hmm. And he knew that we could. He knew that that was we were the only company that could actually do it because we had the people all up and down the East Coast. So what was really fun is he. They finished their journey. They're out for like 18 months, um, and he wanted to move back to Seattle. And oh. he wrote this incredible email. And he wrote it to all the people that have been involved in his journey. And we've got you know, you know we've got almost 700 employees at Hinkley. There was probably 80 people on that email. Oh wow! Yeah. So yeah, it's it's all about the relationship. Just like you're, it's just like what you're doing. The most important thing is the human connection. Yeah, right. Yeah. As humans, that's what we all, that's what we all, you know, are are dying for all the time. And Hinkley is no different. Yeah. We're just making human connections with other people who want to be on the water. Yeah. And we're just supporting them the best we possibly can on a beautiful boat. Right. And creating a platform to create more human connections. Right. Right. That they love and 
You know, it's really, right. that's all it is. Yeah. Know? It's so much more than just a beautiful boat. That's true. Yeah, it's an interesting take on it. Yeah, what you were just describing brings to mind the concept of, like, family, right? Kind of like, okay, yeah. you're on a, you have a broader community, I guess, based yeah. around uh, the boat, the experience, the, the company, and... Um, and we try and do that does feel good on our end too we take care of patients in the office there's an individual relationship with each patient and the surgeon but then there's a hospital involved an anesthesiologist involved and when you get those letters where they're they can speak to the whole team that is really handing off uh their care at various points that's yeah it's a really nice letter to get back and i think yeah. it's a that's the highest praise you can probably yeah. earn, right? When they when they feel compelled to um, express gratitude to yeah. the whole team that that really is moving. It, is that the part of your job that um, where you have the most resonance as a surgeon? Yeah, you know this this would be interesting to see what your thoughts are here, Scott. Like the I don't know how this would translate, but I'll, I'll put it out there and, and let me know if you see any parallels. So. When I first went into practice, I took a job at like a large healthcare system, and I really did not like it. And this was straight out of all the training. You're very committed at this point, and and pretty much stuck. So you, you, you're kind of hoping you continue to like what you're doing. And I found myself not liking what I was doing. And a colleague at the time said, "Yeah, this you know this new corporate medicine model makes everything really transactional," and the term kind of fell flat to me at the time, or maybe I was too young, or I didn't have enough experience to understand what it, what it meant, but, and, and without belaboring it, it, it does turn healthcare into sort of like the Ford Motor Company model, right, this conveyor belt system of, of patient care, and it made patients numbers and not humans, it, it dehumanized the process, but it, yeah. what it did to the fulfillment of the profession was, nobody's people would come to see me because I was an employee at you know, Health System X and they needed a neurosurgeon. So that meant your primary care doctor would check a box on a referral form for blank neurosurgeon, no name, just needs yeah. to go to neurosurgery. So no one's seeing you based on reputation. It's all driven by a system and that dehumanized the interaction. That's the doctor-patient relationship that gets talked about a lot. And yeah. when that became transactional, the profession became very void and unfulfilling. Yeah. And I left without really having that fully in focus, started a private practice, despite the troubles of being in private practice these days with the health insurance situation in the United States. Mm -hmm. And immediately the, you know, kind of having a practice that's built on word of mouth and your reputation completely flipped around that doctor-patient relationship and brought it back to what it is supposed to be and the it's like a different career it's completely fulfilling yeah patients i see are you know oh you operated on my mother you operated on my friend i came to see you because they spoke so highly of how you cared for them that's a completely different experience than a, a waiting room filled with people who yeah. don't even know your name. You know, the, the, a system yeah. just sent them there on an elevator. Yeah. Um, so I, I, maybe I rambled off the point there, but uh. no, that's. I think what's interesting though is that um, that I think that is the essence. If you you know, if you ask most people about you know, if you ask people who are in this kind of so any kind of social business where you have where interaction with people is the most important is one of the most important mm -hmm. aspects yeah um they would probably come say the same thing it's about the connection yeah. with people that is really the highlight yeah um and that's really what it comes down to and it's funny that the structure of a business or an industry can you know really affect that in a detrimental way nothing against health systems i don't know what the parallel in the in the boating world would be but you know, I know the health systems are trying to become high reliability organizations and, and minimize error. They kind of see themselves as as parallels to the airline industry, where it's just we yeah. can reproducibly fly, you know, a thousand yeah. flights a day without error. 
and th- and that's a laudable, you know, noble goal. But the, the current structure of it, it can be such that it strips the humanity out of it. And yeah, yeah you, you might argue if you fly a lot, uh, the same things, <laughs> the same things, an issue in the uh, right. airline industry. Um, I wanted to pivot just quickly and ask. Yeah. You know, from where you guys are now, where do you see the future? I mean, where what changes over the next ten years in boating? I I was recently um, having a conversation with someone on the water talking about um, the gasoline requirements for their. They had a pretty large boat, and they were explaining how much gasoline that took. So I imagine there's sort of green pressure on the industry. You know, ten, fifteen, twenty years down the road, what what? Not not that you have to comment on the green element, but what do you see changing? You know, um, it's interesting. We we're, we're we're kind of an industry company because we only, if you can believe it, um, we only build uh, between thirty five and forty five boats a year. Okay? Wow. Yeah, but we have every year we have hundreds and hundreds of boats that are in our care uh-huh. from a um, from a, a, a yacht care and customer relationship perspective yeah. um, so we have this funny saying you know um, that 3,000 people get to get to the top of Mount Everest every year but only 30 to 40 people get to own a new Hinkley right um, <laughs> so you know it's a very um, it's it's a it's it's a very kind of small group of people that to do that with that said um, we pride ourselves on having this very kind of small and nimble engineering group, engineering hmm. and design group, such that we've designed and execute our own control system in our boats, in our jet boats, in our you know, water jet boats, where that we developed 25 years ago, and it's evolved over the past 25 years. We have the, one of the best control systems in the industry, where hmm. you, as someone you, you mentioned that you've got some boat experience, you could get on our 48 foot and 48 foot boat and easily put it right into a dock, Whoa. no problem, Whoa. With, it, with the joystick. Yeah, and that's there are other control systems out there that do something, do similar type things that have developed over the past five to seven years. We've been doing it for 25 years. We've got the best system on the market. It's really remarkable. Huh. But what I, what, I, what I mean by all that is that we've done, we, we have this kind of technological bend to us. Mm-hmm. You know, in 2017, we built a concept boat that was all electric, mm-hmm. um, just as a concept to show that we're, you know, we're thinking about this. We're trying to figure out how to introduce new technologies into our boats that are, um, that don't, you know, that are just a little bit more friendly for our customers, friendly for the environment, as much as we can, and that's within our capability. Um, yeah. Last year, we introduced something called Silent Jet, which was which is a hybrid diesel electric propulsion system uh, that is now sold on our Picnic Boat 40. So you can now leave the marina in total silence under electric power, Whoa. and then when you give the when you give the system more throttle and it needs more than just what the electric can provide, automatically diesel engines come on. Oh, wow. Uh, and power the boat to top speed, however fast you need to go. And while it's running, it recharges all those batteries within 30 minutes. That's cool. So that you can go back to going slow. It automatic, the diesel engines automatically turn off when you go slow enough, you go back to silence. Yeah. So it's a, we're, we developed that system with a company called Twin Disc. That's coming out. That's in our Picnic Boat 40 now as a, as an option that you can get. So we do these types of technologies to try to um, not be on the bleeding edge, right? But really be on the leading edge yeah. of what of of what's out there. I say all that, but what's but what we really like, what we're, what we're you know destined to build our business on. Sure, are there's changes that are going to be coming, but the things that will never change in our business is the desire for people to get on the water mm-hmm. and to have great service. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're focused on, trying to um, trying to refine always, is how do we provide better service? How do we, um, you know, how do we provide people a better experience out on the water? And if it means developing something that is, you know, that is more environmentally friendly, then that's what we do. But it's all about our customers. We, I don't know if you've seen this. We were. I recently took a vacation with the family, and we were on the Mediterranean for a minute. And there was a like a, it almost looked like a picnic boat, and it popped up on foils, and kind of rode around on the foils. And I, yep. th- I hadn't seen that before. I mean, I saw the surfers kind of doing this foil thing, yep. but I hadn't seen mm-hmm. that. 
Um, and again, the gentleman was commenting, it's all, you know, reducing drag, reducing fuel. Yeah, I'm that's sure, right. Sure, it rides very differently, but. Yeah. Um, and then I, the other thing I wanted to comment on, and this is more of a, for my own edification, I know the, the Newport uh, boat show is coming up in this area. Yep. Mm -hmm. This is more like learning about the boating world. Where does that where is that on your uh, on your radar? Is that sort of like a, a Super Bowl type event in the boating industry, or are these or are these a dime a dozen that kind of pop up all over the place throughout the season, or is it a is it you know a handful that are big destinations for a company like Hinkley? Yeah, good question. So um, there, you know, if you wanted to, you could literally go to a boat show every other weekend. Okay. In the, in our country and go find one. Yeah. Um, we are pretty selective about the shows that we do. Um, you know, this you know this year our big shows are uh, New the Newport Boat Show. We do the Fort Lauderdale Boat Show and the Palm Beach Boat Show. Wow. Um, and in all the other regions where we are, you know, be it Annapolis, um, on the you know, and then on the um, west coast of Florida. And on the west coast of our country, you know, in, in Seattle, we do do small regional shows. But for the most part, what we do are small, um, you know, kind of VIP events where we invite customers on a limited number basis to come and experience our product. Hmm. Um, so we do small kind of pop-up events, sometimes in conjunction with, uh, you know, a restaurant or something like that. Oh, yeah. And we found that those are, you know, getting back to the relational part of our business, that's a better place for us to build relationships with our clients. Yeah, right. Um, where people can come and be relaxed and be around the boats. But that said, when we do our boat shows, we try to activate at our boat shows much in that same way. So it's all by appointment only. You come, you create an appointment and you come and see our boats. We have, you know, um, we've, we've got, you know, all sorts of refreshments. We have an open bar that's in our, you know, that's in our, um, our boat show, that's in our setup. There's beautiful furniture. It's more of an experience than mm -hmm. it is just going to the show. Right. And we just so as a result, we only do a few of those a year because they're hard to do, and we've got a small team. So we try to activate and do the best possible presentation at those events instead of doing lots of events. Yeah. To answer your question, I mean the Newport show is a great one for us. The Fort Lauderdale is good. Palm Beach Boat Show is a big show for us. Is it okay? Um, and then we try to activate in, all, in a bunch of other places, but not on like a boat show level. Do you, if for Newport, by example, will you guys have every model there? No, um, we will have uh, we'll have four models there. Okay. Um, so typically, we don't we won't have every one of our models at the show. Um, we'll just have kind of new. Uh, newer boats that are there or you know um, newer models that are there um, we don't believe it or not we don't own any Hinkley's as the Hinkley organization we don't own anything no so kidding. we have these relationships with our clients because um, we can't we can't afford them right um, so <laughs> We, uh, we, we borrow boats from our clients and they partner with us. They love to have their boats there on display. And yeah. you know, sometimes after the show, we'll shut the booth down and they bring a party on board their boat and they have a great time. That's so great. it's, you know, we have to borrow our clients' boats in order to do these events. That's amazing. That makes it a little, that, that adds a whole nother element. This is, this is a silly question, but I did see a couple picnic and maybe like 50 foot yachts out in the Mediterranean. How do, how would those make the journey? Are they put on like a barge and sent over? Yeah, they're put on a big ship. Yeah, um, wow. And uh, there's a couple of services out there that will, you know, come into one of our yards. Yeah. And we just run the boat out there and they literally pick it up, put it on the deck and off they go. And off they go. All right. <laughs> yeah. That's basically the way it works. Yeah. Well, um, Scott, thanks so much for your time. I, uh, I really appreciate it. Really enjoyed the conversation. Um, I don't want to take your whole afternoon. I, uh, uh, I know around here we see Hinkley's on a regular basis in the, uh, on the Sound, around the city, uh, all around the uh, New York metropolitan area. And uh, it's always a privilege to kind of see them and, and experience them, granted, from a distance. Um, you didn't have to offer to send me over a free boat, but you did. I totally appreciate that. <laughs> 
I guess I could just pick that up in my local marina. Will you, will you be handing it off yourself? Or that's, uh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, just stop on by. It'll be there waiting for you. <laughs> okay. right, exactly. Uh, but in all honesty, anytime you want to swing by Portsmouth, that's where our corporate headquarters are. I'd be happy to give you a tour, show you the boats, and uh, take you for a ride. You guys are in Portsmouth, but they produce them in Maine. Yeah. So our our manufacturing facility is up in uh, Trenton, Maine. Uh, which is right near uh, Mount Desert Island, and then we have a we've got a service organization in Southwest Harbor. We have one in Northeast Harbor. We also so we're in Portsmouth here. We're in Stamford, Connecticut, Annapolis, oh, yeah, okay. Easton. We're in Savannah, Georgia, Stewart, Florida, and Naples, and uh, also up in Fort Myers. I didn't mention that in the beginning. Like another reason uh, we had reached out was obviously living here uh, in New York, seeing a lot of Hinkleys, and just being a new boater and appreciating them. But last summer, I think, I took a family vacation up to Bar Harbor, and uh, oh, and uh, we took like a, I don't think they have tour buses, but we had gotten a woman to drive us around, just give us a tour of the area, and she sort of gave us the, you know, bird's eye view of, of the operation up there, and, and I had oh, no great. idea, I had no idea that's where they were manufactured, it was, it's such a beautiful setting, I mean, my God. Yeah. Um, yeah. What a great place to work, I would imagine. It is, yeah. It's a it's a remarkable place up there. Yeah. Um, we, yeah. we did a we did a great video um, two years ago about kind of the boat building, the Hinkley lifestyle of building boats in Maine. That's on our website. That's a fun watch. Do uh, just to kind of do the folks live there? Do a lot of people that work there live in the area? Or, or oh, yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah, yep. They do, and that's they. They, you know, it's it's become more of a challenge recently because the, the price of uh, real estate's gotten so expensive out there. Yeah, uh, so um, that's become more of a challenge recently as we've gone to kind of slowly grow the business and bring more people on. Yeah, um, that's been a bit of a challenge for us. But you know, it's it's um, people who live in Maine are committed to living in Maine. And yeah, it's a special culture. Yeah, you know, totally. That's a really romantic. Uh, you know, profession too, right? Live in Maine, right on the coast, build boats. I mean, yeah. What more could you ask for? I guess <laughs> not a whole lot. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, Scott. Really appreciate your willingness to do this. And uh, like I said, we'll we'll have our guy edit it up and then send it over to you. And if you're okay Great. with it, we'll just post Perfect. it around. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate Thank you. Bye bye. All right. See ya. Yep. Bye. Hey, John. I don't want to delete anything. John, are you there?